Welcome Spartans to another Halo Book Club episode as part of Podcast Evolved, your home for Halo. I'm your host today, David, and with me is Aaron. Hi guys. That's right, we got a two guy book club, because everyone else is busy. Everyone else sucks. Yeah, don't mind them. Today was an easy one too, so and it was a pretty good one to be fair. We have started the Halo graphic novel, and this book club is about the last voyage of the Infinite Sucker, which is a long-winded title for the first episode, but it's pretty great. It's a good old read. Before we jump into it, let's do some social stuffs. So if you're new to the show, welcome. Podcast Evolved is a host to a variety of shows. This is the book club where we obviously talk about the novels, short stories, and comics. We have other shows that are Podcast Evolved, the main show, Mission Debrief, and Bills of Blocks, and our partnership with HTS Pro Talk with Joss and Will as they discuss the latest information with the competitive Halo scene. So loads of stuff on that every week. You can learn more about each of them on our awesome website, which is halopodcastevolved.com. You can also find us at halopodcast.com. If you're already a fan of the show, we ask you to rate us and leave us a review. These help us a lot. Thank you very much. Give us some feedback. Let us know what we got wrong, what we get right, what you would like to see more of, all that good stuff. Right now, I would also like to thank all of our patrons. So thank you all so much for your support. You guys are pretty incredible. We got to thank you guys every show because you kind of make all this happen. So thank you all very, very much for your support. If you want to be a patron, you get many awards, such as early episodes, unique swag, access to our own soundtrack. That's right. Featuring 18 songs. It's pretty damn great. Head over to patreon.com slash halo podcast evolved to learn more. Should you be interested? And finally, we encourage our listeners to support Audible, where they can enjoy all of the Halo novels all in one place, along with thousands of other different kind of novels, wellness programs, and way more. So if you would like to do that, you can go to audibletrial.com slash podcast evolved to learn more and get a free trial today. Aaron, we read this today. I imagine you read it today also. It's the biggest one in this novel. Uh, I think the biggest kind of story with the, the largest kind of paid count. It's pretty damn great. I, I pretty enjoy. I, I enjoyed it. it. It was weird. Like, I kind of forgot about this is an old comic. Like, it's 2006 is when it first came out. So much has happened since then, even in terms of the comics, but um, it's it's pretty unique. I have never read this before. I did not know this existed until about two weeks ago when I happened to go, <laughs> oh, we have a book club coming up soon. I should look into this. So this was all completely new to me. I skipped over the graphic novel completely, so it's always nice to get a new old story and to go through it. Yeah. It's pretty good. Would you like me to run through the details here before we bounce into it? Do, do. So like we said, it's the last voyage of the Infinite Sucker. It is authored by Lee Hammock. It is published by Marvel. Which is weird. Yes, that was back in the day when Marvel did the Halo stuff. It was available in, I believe, soft and hardback. And at some point down the line, it may have made an appearance as a digital version as well, I'm not entirely sure. So we had the original release, which was the 19th of July 2006. Then we had a new edition released in September 28th, 20... That year is wrong, sorry. 2010, I think, is the one that's on the back of this book that I have. So there was a re-release in September 2010, and there is now a new version coming out later this year. It will be available on August 11th of 2021. And that will be published by Dark Horse Comics. That will also be a paperback. So if, like me, you never got round to this, you can then go and order a new copy and read the entire thing. Which is pretty cool. It is. It's nice to get these older things that were out of print back into circulation again because it can be kind of pricey going through looking for old copies. It was one of those things I just waited until Amazon showed me something that was reasonably priced and I would grab it here and there. Mm-hmm. So the entire graphic novel is 128 pages. This story itself is 50. The summary goes as follows. This story takes place during the events of Halo Combat Evolved. When communications from a Covenant agricultural support ship the Infinite Sucker are mysteriously terminated. Special Operations Commander Radis Fatimi, also known as Halfjaw, 
and his squad of special forces are sent to investigate. What they find is a peril more deadly and terrifying than any human threat, creatures never officially seen before by Covenant nor human eyes alike. Ooh. As they start off so confident in this. So, like we said, the timeline, this is Combat Evolved, this is September 21st, 2552, quite early in a lot of the the lore and timeline for Halo. Yeah, it's really interesting, actually, the fact that it takes place during the events of the game. It's pretty cool. I find it really intriguing. It opens on the events of the game, which is interesting because... I got to the first page and was like, ooh, Master Chief's in this. And yeah. I was like, no, Master Chief is not. It was a bait switch. Yeah, so the locations, like we said, the Infinite Sucker. We've got four real characters. We have the the Minister of Etology. We have Radis Vadami. We have Baro Kosovi. And we have Thel Vadami. Those are the four named characters, and then we have, spoilers, the Flood. Yay! Do we want to just talk about the story and we'll butt in as we go? Because there's not a huge amount to this. I suppose it's easy enough to go. Like I said, it kicks off when Chief is dropped into the swamp when he's going to search for keys. And there's a spirit dropship that takes off and it flies off the halo. And it flies towards the Infinite Sucker, which is an interesting looking starship. It's really cool looking. It's pretty crazy. Judging by when you get into the story, it must be on a colossal scale, even though it doesn't quite look it in the art, because it has this massive big agricultural dome in the middle and all these antennas out the back. And these two big sort of like spinal arches coming up either side of the dome. It's hard to guess the scale of it from the way that it's drawn. When you realise what it is, which you don't initially know, that it's where the fleet grows and gets a lot of their food from, which is pretty cool. So like you said, this big kind of agri bubble in the middle of the ship. It's pretty cool. We've seen kind of similar things like this and other sci-fi stuff. But it's cool to see the Kovalin version of it. Yeah. We get this spirit dropship. It, it's coming into the bay. The ship's like, oh no, no, you're not supposed to be here. And then it just smashes into the bay all the grunts like scramble to put the fires out and then something dark and menacing comes out of the dropship. The grunts are panicking, then there's blood everywhere. Mm-hmm. And then one grunt manages to get a partial med out before he gets his brain splattered across the keypad. And then it switches to Seeker of Truth, which is the flagship of the Covenant Fleet of Particular Justice. And that name may be familiar because that is the Arbiter's Fleet, or was the Arbiter's Fleet. We start with a training duel between... Ratas. Is it between Ratas and Barrow? Yeah, it is. It's between Ratas and... No, or, yeah, Barrow Kasabi. Because the I sometimes get a little bit confused with the artwork. Yes, it is confusing to tell who's who in this. You kind of, you're used to like the commander, like our half draw being like in white armor and him like standing out way more to all the other elites. But um, in this comic, it, your only way you can tell it's him is that he's dual wielding swords. But in this fight, there's two of them dual wielding swords and the color palette doesn't really help you to you know, like figure out what the, what, what's going on. Yeah, Radis is kind of slightly lighter, so you can occasionally tell. His helmet is a little differently shaped as well, but there's a lot of trying to figure out what's going on. So they're having this training lesson. Radis gets injured in it, but he stops and tells the rest of his troops, he's like, what lesson did we learn here? And they all go like, well, Barrow would have taken your head off. And Radis goes, yes, but my momentum would have carried my sword through Barrow, so I would have killed him anyway. And he's teaching them a, an important lesson on getting a kill from beyond the grave. Pretty much. Which is a, a tactic I use a lot in Halo. <laughs> Drop a grenade, if in doubt, and attempt to take someone out as you go. So he has this little lesson with them, and then he's summoned by the uh, fleet commander. Supreme commander who looks fucking crazy. You would not have known that it's like, it's not mentioned that it's the Arbiter, or it's not even like, Felvadimi is never mentioned. He's just referred to as the Supreme Commander. But he's in these 
big purple robes and he's got this crazy purple armor that makes him look more like alien from like the Ridley Scott aliens like it looks crazy yeah his armor is very alien and then his robe is very Sith Lord yeah total if he appeared in a hologram somewhere and was talking to Palpatine you'd be going this makes sense yeah He's pretty damn regal, regal looking is the way they've kind of put him. But it's pretty cool. He just gets that one kind of page panel of giving Ratas his kind of objective. Go to the ship, here are the codes that will override everything except for the minister's codes. Go check out and see what's going on. They think it's humans because the grunt got all that message saying, no, they have human weapons, but they're not human. But he died before you could say that bit. So they all think, oh, it's probably, they think it might be Master Chief over there. Yes, they, they reckon he's the only one capable of boarding the ship. They do a nice way of, of saying earlier of like a conversation of like the reason why we haven't seen any of these guys yet on the Halo is that they've been in space the whole time. So that their job is to guard this ship. So that's why, let's say, an easy way in the canon of saying like why Ratas was not down there hunting Chief in Halo 1. And I get the feeling that his troops are a little restless and he's having to tell them, look... There's glory in guarding the fleet in space and not just on being on the ground. Yeah, exactly. There's also a bit of weird, like, size perspective thing where Thel looks fucking massive in some of these panels. He's like this towering giant, which is interesting. But we roll on to the Phantom. So Ratus gathers up his troops and his grunt cannon fodder and the... They board their phantom and off the head to the sucker. Having said that, like he, he a little bit later, like he's he treats the grunts really well. Where like he like puts them in like tries to protect them a lot and stuff. Yeah, once they realize that swords they get into this, they get onto the ship and they get attacked by the flood pretty quickly into it. And they figure out fairly quickly that energy swords are the way to go in this fight. And he, like, he tells the elites to form a wall and he's like, tells the grunts, tuck in behind us, provide cover fire, don't get caught. And you're like, if this was a brute right now, he would have chucked the grunts at the flood to get away. Radis seems like a good team leader. He does, yeah. He's kind of, they quickly established that like, oh, the humans didn't do this. We're after finding a Hurgok blood, like smashed to pieces. So it was like, okay, this is not humans, this is something else. And then they like open the dome and they go into this crazy jungle and they're like, there should be loads of animals here. What the hell is going on? And like they pick up the sensor and it's like, okay, this is where shit gets crazy then. I was flicking through this and I got confused for a second. I was like, did we switch back to Chief in the swamp? What? And then I was looking going, it's like, oh no, we're here. Did the flood take over this place so quickly? Because it looks crazy. Like they're alien plants, but like they're obviously normal because none of the team reacts to them. So it must be okay. This jungle like atmosphere is just in this ship as per usual on the next panel you get to it you can now that i've noticed you see like the dome structure in the background there's a panel where they're like walking along a river and in the background you can see like curves and triangles that are clearly supposed to be the dome once you know to look for them yeah you're right it's a it's an unusual art style because we encounter flood flood forms we've never seen before that are I think before the show when we were talking I described it very much as this is the thing these are not the flood you know from Combat Evolved or Halo 2 these are creatures from the thing gone wild they are they're creepy they're disgusting they're like they're awesome it, it must it must be more like the, because we see other flood forms later on that are more traditional I'm, I'm guessing this flood f- these flood forms are from the animals that were supposed to be here the wildlife that they ingested and took over because they're just like indescribably alien they're very sort of bigfoot gorilla creature things they've got these massive jaws multiple eyes but these like long arms that end in like large curved teethed claws like hook arms and you see them carrying one of them at the start has like two or three animals hooked into its claws on its back and it's carrying them along and then the elites get jumped they form like their protective wall they're trying to back out of the area and get to i think at first they're trying to get to the bridge yeah and then they realize that's a no-go the panels of the fight scenes are crazy of like it's hard to decide or to to kind of break apart what flood creature and what isn't and the blood is splattering everywhere like it's 
mental. They're so visceral. You see them like splitting these creatures into pieces. Like you get to the panels here where they're, they're they've like backed out of the dome into the corridors and they're trying to clear the door to seal it behind them and they're chucking grenades in and it's just like a mass of color and bits and you can see like the elites running out over rib cages and there's something that looks to be a skull that's split open with like a long spiked tongue coming out of it and you're just like this is all ugh. there's a couple of like vaguely familiar human flood forms in the middle of it yeah they have human weapons which they're shooting at them as well and then like there's a cool there's a segment where like the commander has a hard light shield and I was like, oh, I did not remember this at all. And it's like an unusual shape as well. Yeah, it's very Riot Shield. He has this on a, mounted on his forearm and he's using it to like keep the flood back while they get out. So they seal the door. They've lost a few teammates along the way. Now, this is important because when he got the codes, he gave the codes to his entire boarding party. And now these flood, even though they're like, there isn't, well, they're, kind of as a grave mind later but they're rather more self-aware than the usual flood creatures and they're they know all the codes they've been patrolling the ship they've set up defenses yeah once they've taken an elite they kind of get gain all his knowledge and knowledge of the ship that they're on and stuff so like they become way more like aggressive and more organized yeah, they work their way up the corridor. Eventually, they realize their codes aren't letting them like take over the ship, and they realize it's because the minister is still alive. So he contacts them, and he wants them to go to sickbed to prove that they're not infected because he says, we, I don't have enough information on how the infection takes hold and how slow or fast it is, so you've got to go and get yourself scanned to prove that you're not one of them. So Rotas is like pretty much pissed off straight away by this guy, but he can't, but he won't, he won't be overruled. So he pretty much has to fight his way back off the bridge. They like get the grunts to destroy the bridge and then like try and leg it and get, get themselves through medical. So like there's loads more scenes now of like fight scenes through the corridors of like them taking enemies and it's pretty cool. It's just, it feels rushed, like it feels hectic. The one thing in particular is when the Flood breach the room that they're in and this Flood elite form comes in and it has these green veins running through its body where it has like burst out of its armoured sections. It's a really like cool striking design. And then very quickly we're back to the abominations. It's really damn cool. I mean, they eventually get their way to the medical bay, right? And it's like the minister at okay yeah you're clean come on this bridge and he brings him he has like a panic room essentially where he's hidden in but like he didn't tell any of the crew so that's why the flood doesn't know where he is because none of the crew know where he is so he's pretty much just like oh yeah we knew what the flood was it's a, it's a test um, but we didn't know the details of the flood so he talks about like and there's like a cool scene of the flood like infecting the ship and taking over all the wildlife just seeing eating all these crazy creatures it's, it's so cool and the minister is just like, you have to get me out of here. We're, we can't go. And then he's like, he wants your man's plan to get him out and also stop stop the ship. It's so cool looking. Just these panels of like, like the flood have taken over engineering. They've vented the vacuum to space and all the other floors where they're not on. Which is weird to think that the flood would do that because that's kind of like a tactic you would use against them. Um, so they're just like, okay... These two places, which I think is like engineering and I think they mentioned somewhere else. But uh, obviously they want to slip space their way out. He's like, okay, how do we stop them? And Ratas gets like pissed with him, which is which is pretty great. So he like, he says like, okay, you've got no, you've got no um, vacuum suits for elites because there's no elites on this ship typically. So he's like, okay, we have to get the crew to flag down the ship. They have no communication, sorry, they're disabled as well. So it's like, okay, we have to flag down our dropship visually. So you're going to have to go to the kind of exit and kind of like, I think he later describes it with grenades, uh, attract the ship. So like, he's like, okay, I want to take four leads with me. We're going to engineering. Everybody else, take the minister and go. And the minister's like, don't divide your forces. You have to protect me. And Rattas does something like I didn't think he would do. He just picks up this minister and fucks him to the ground, like busts his face in. And it's just like, it'd be a simple matter to make it appear that you died in a flood attack. Now give me your command codes. Which is like, totally badass. I did not think he would be doing, he'd do that to a minister. But it's really exciting to see him like, 
that's his character from the beginning. Yeah, like it totally makes sense when you know where he goes and that he would have these sort of thoughts and feelings because, of course, the Arbiter's kind of inclined that way as well. So he doesn't have this reverence to this particular guy anyway. So he believes in the covenant, not in the ministers per se. Yes, and the minister is not as important as the mission. And the goal of the mission is to stop this ship from spreading the flood anywhere else. And that's all he's interested in. Which answers the question of why in Halo 2 he recognises the smell of the flood. Yes, exactly. Because he's fought so personally, because all the next screens are just him slicing and dicing his way through the ship with his team of four dudes. And just they all just have plasma swords just cutting their way through. It's awesome using grenades, opening doors and like blowing things apart. It's awesome. So many skulls and teeth in all of these flood forms. It's really terrifying. Every time they're being attacked by something, there's just like a mass of body parts. Pinks and luminous greens and purples and stuff. Yeah. So they fight their way to engineering. And there you see the human flood forms are all working away. They're doing shit on the consoles. And the elites take everyone out and the last of the team gets injured. But he's not dead yet. And he basically says to Radis, don't let me become one of them. Uh, where is the line here that Radis says back to him? Though you leave this world, you will come on the great journey when the time comes. And then splits him in half vertically. Like, holy shit. It's like, there, that's that done with. And then, unfortunately, that is not that done with because the flood bring him back to life from his dead corpse. I don't know if it was that one in particular or if it was another guy. It's, I think it's him because he quotes the line back at him. The infected flood form at the very end uh, says, uh, though, you, though you leave this world... Uh, oh, well, no, maybe it is Radis once again, sorry. I, I thought it was, I, I got a little confused in the fight scene. I thought it was the flood form quoting the line back to Radis, but it is Radis as he slices the flood infected elite down the middle that was a really cool fight that one because again like right before that he's like obviously he's doing things on the controls and then he cuts to like okay the minister has just been like absorbed by the flood and he's like we have the command codes we will spread and uh, it has like you will find that difficult abomination and that's when he gets attacked by this elite that's been infected and it's a cool fight because the dual sword and dual sword and like this elite pretty much fucks him up already like he sacrifices his arm pretty much to get hit and it kind of like he, he allows the sword that's stuck in his arm to cut his own face and head so that he can get a killing stroke on on the thing which i i like to go back and read again because it's kind of hard to see what happens but that's pretty much where he loses his mandibles and like some of his helmet is from the sword it's a really cool panel though yeah, it's it's all very busy and the panels are kind of overlapping a lot and you're sort of trying to figure out what's going on. That's where I got confused with the dialogue between the two of them. Rattas says it again. I'm pretty sure it's just talking to his brother. You will leave this world, you will come on the great journey when time comes, die with honour. And then again, splits him in half, vertically. And then he like limps off back to the hangar bay. Although he gets he has that last like conversation with the infected minister the foreigners not defeat us what chance of you he says if it takes my death so be it you will you will not defeat the covenant and then he just kind of limps away and you get the message that says slip space jump in two minutes prior to slip space operations and you see like the um the dropship picking him up and just leaving and then that's the kind of end of it so like we had a discussion and i had to kind of look it up of like okay what the hell happened so i think he had configured the slip space to shoot them into the sun of, of the system is, is what actually happened yeah he he says it earlier on that his plan was to send the ship into the sun and destroy it but like i i missed it the first time round, so i was the same as you i was at the end of it going where, where's the slip space jump going but he sends the ship into the sun thus destroying the flood on the ship being the sole survivor then of his team it's such a cool comic in building him out as like a character and like he obviously becomes into his own in Halo 2 and he's obviously goes on to other books as well where he's pretty awesome in his own novels 
but it was it's great just to see the origin of him why he knows the smell of flood like you said what happened to his face his like anger towards ministers and stuff like that i love it he has like a very personal tone with the arbiter and you're like where where does this come from like what is it but you know now that they've worked together before and the arbiter sent him on this suicidal mission that he came back from so of course when he escorts the arbiter on his suicidal mission he's sort of respectful but honest with him as well so no it's it's really cool and i like the art style a lot like i said it's very it's not your usual flood it's very much the thing it's heads molded into heads eyes uh, skulls and jaws with no flesh on them just muscular it is halo horror do you know what i mean like it's it's what you'd, you'd love to see it like do you know what i mean i'd love to see flood like this it makes something like the Mona Lisa not seem as bad because at least in the Mona Lisa you know it's the usual run of the mill flood. If if I was to play Halo Infinite and Flood started to come out of the woodwork in these forms, I would shit myself. <laughs> the library would be so much more terrifying if that big tooth clawed thing came out of somewhere. If this is if this is the flood you were fighting, it would change the concept of of, of Halo. Of like the, those kind of missions. I mean, it's a great comic as well because like we've seen this before. Flood infect the ship, like you said, Mona Lisa. There's one or two stories that are like the same of like a few flood get onto a ship and take it over. So this ship is like has to be quarantined down or, or or whatever. But like it's interesting to see it from the Covenant perspective and like the minister and like Ratas says that like um it would take maybe like because of the amount of time it takes to get here to do this to signal that they would have enough time to slip space away. So like, and even like, by the time we organize the fleet, get the fleet into position with all the proper codes and authorization to destroy one of their own ships, that would take too long. They have to blow up the ship. He has to do it. I love that he breaks it down very quickly and succinctly of the Covenant cannot do this, react quick enough to this. I have to do it. And that's, that's pretty much where he like beats the shit out of the, out of the minister. But it was cool. There's a little blurb at the start before you go into the story telling you about it and they specifically say this piece was conceived primarily as a vehicle to educate the fans about the real danger of the flood that they are a rapacious intelligent goal oriented life form with internal structure slash protoculture and hopefully euthanize the idea that they are just space zombies and i think this does a very good job of these aren't just the same creatures that you see in the library just roaming around squeaking and then trying to take you over yeah, because obviously it d- does show them like being very good at like organizing, of hacking, of like understanding the knowledge that they assimilate, like integrating with the ship's systems, all that kind of stuff. And they are just absolutely terrifying, so that helps a lot. I like this story; it's pretty good. As one that I've never read before, I wasn't disappointed when I finished it. I remember that it existed, but I couldn't have told you anything about it. Like if you said Infinite Sucker, I was like, oh yeah, that's something I read. And if you had even have told me that that's the one about Ratas, I would like, okay. But I don't think I would have remembered the specifics. I knew there was a comic about him losing, how he lost his jaw and stuff like that. But I wouldn't remember any of the panels or anything like that. But it was pretty cool. It was exciting to read again. Yeah, no, I, I agreed. I quite liked it. Um, it makes me look forward to the next one. Yeah, they're very different stories in this, in this novel, actually. All four of them are very different. You might like the one with Ben but um, they're not all as action orientated some of them are just cool stories and they're, the rest of them are much shorter as well well that's good because uh, yeah I looked at the 50 pages and went Jesus but only half the pages have dialogue the rest of them are just art yeah exactly just fight scenes and stuff right are we good? that's pretty much it there's not much to the trivia to this it was just a few kind of interesting things of like Bungie made the novel and then went out to people to see who would publish it. So they themselves went and contacted the artists and the writers, wrote the comic. They did that specifically so that they wouldn't have to run into any problems with like allegiances to one brand or another or like this artist works with them so can't work with you kind of stuff. So they went and just did it, made the comic and then said, we have a finished comic, we need a publisher. So they went out and eventually found Marvel. Marvel got in, got in touch with them obviously and they liked this comic, which I thought was cool. And obviously not the way Halo, they've done things since. Well, obviously, this was all done like by Bungie as well and stuff like that. So it was um, this was all Bungie trying to get this done, so which is interesting as uh, as a way of kind of getting it kind of finished. And I don't know, it was pretty cool. It was an interesting way to kind of do things. And that 
this comic did so well that like that's what green lit the rest of the marvel series so that's where halo uprising and stuff happened now obviously eventually they moved away from marvel comics and and uh, got a deal with dark horse to do everything else it's kind of interesting that dark horse are republishing this which is pretty cool but that that's kind of where that came from so i just thought that was an interesting kind of tidbit of, of how they got it made that's that's pretty much it guys i don't really have anything else so i will say thank you all for joining us like we mentioned at the top of the show, you can find all of our shows on HaloPodcastEvolved.com and we got our links over there for Discord server, Facebook group, Patreon page, Xbox Live Club and everything else. Uh, once again, another special shout out for all of our patrons for supporting the show and making all of this possible. Go to Patreon.com slash PodcastEvolved to learn more. And finally, if you want to leave us a voicemail, you can do so on 205Evolved. That's 205-386-5833 should you wish to give us a call and leave a little message to us. Thank you very much, and with that, I have been your host, David, and until next time, Evolved. Evolved.